manhood. Manhood is the isthmus between two extremes, the ripe, the fertile season of action when alone we can hope to find the head to contrive united with the hand to execute. Each age has its peculiar duties and privileges, pleasures and pains. When young, we trust ourselves too much. When old, we trust others too little. Rashness is the error of youth, timid caution of age. In youth, we build castles and plan for ourselves a course of action through life. As we approach old age, we see more and more plainly that we are simply carried forward by a mighty torrent, born here and there against our will. We then perceive how little control we have had in reality over our course, that our actions, resolves, and endeavors, which seem to give such a guiding course to our life, are but eddies of the mighty stream that rolls to its appointed end. In childhood, time goes by on leaden wings, 10, 20 years. A lifetime seems an endless period. At manhood, we are surprised that time goes so rapidly. We then comprehend the fleeting period of life, in old age, the years that are past seem as a dream of the night, our life as a tale nearly told. Childhood is the season of dreams and high resolves, manhood of plans and actions, age of retrospection and regret. There is certainly no age more potential for good or evil than that of early manhood. The young men have, with much propriety, been denominated the flower of a country. To be a man and seem to be one are two different things. All young men should carefully consider what is meant by manhood. It does not consist in years simply, nor in form and figure. It lies above and beyond these things. It is the product of the cultivation of every power of the soul, and of every high spiritual quality naturally inherent or graciously supplemented. It should be the great object of living to attain this true manhood. There is no higher pursuit for the youth to propose to himself. He is standing at the opening gates of active life. There he catches the first glimpse of the possibilities in store for him. There he first perceives the duties that will shortly devolve upon him. What higher aim can he propose to himself than to act his part in life as becomes a man who lives not only for time but for eternity? How earnestly should he resolve to walk worthily in all that true manhood requires? There are certain claims, great and weighty, resting upon all young men, which they cannot shake off if they would. They grow out of those indissoluble relations which they sustain to society and those invaluable interests, social, civil, and religious, with all the duties and responsibilities connected with them, which are soon to be transferred to their shoulders from the venerable fathers who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. The various departments of business and trust, the pulpit and the bar, our courts of justice and halls of legislation, our civil, religious, and literary institutions, all in short that constitute society and go to make life useful and happy are to be in their hands and under their control. Society, in committing to the young her interests and privileges, imposes upon them corresponding claims and demands that they be prepared to fill with honor and usefulness the places which they are destined to occupy. Young men cannot take a rational view of the station to which they are advancing or of the duties that are coming upon them without feeling deeply their need of high and peculiar qualifications. Every young man should come forward in life with a determination to do all the good he can and to leave the world the better for his having lived in it. He should consider that he was not made for himself alone, but for society, for mankind, and for God. He should consider that he is a constituent, responsible member of the great family of man, and while he should pay particular attention to the wants and welfare of those with whom he is immediately connected, he should accustom himself to send his thoughts abroad over the wide field of practical benevolence. There is within the young man an uprising of lofty sentiments which contribute to his elevation, and though there are obstacles to be surmounted and difficulties to be vanquished, yet with truth for his watchword and relying on his own noble purposes and exertions, he may crown his brow with imperishable honors. He may never wear the warrior's crimson wreath, the poet's chaplet of bays, or the statesman's laurels, 
though no grand universal truth may at his bidding stand confessed to the world, though it may never be his to bring to a successful issue a great political revolution, to be the founder of a republic which shall be a distinguished star in the constellation of nations, even more though his name may never be heard beyond the narrow limits of his own neighborhood, yet is his mission nonetheless a high and noble one. In the moral and physical world, not only the field of battle, but also the cause of truth and virtue, calls for champions, and the field for doing good is white unto the harvest. If he enlists in the ranks, and his spirits faint not, he may write his name among the stars of heaven. Beautiful lives have blossomed in the darkest places, as pure white lilies, full of fragrance, sometimes bloom on the slimy, stagnant waters. No possession is so productive of real influence as a highly cultivated intellect. Wealth, birth, and official station may and do secure an external superficial courtesy, but they never did and never can secure the reverence of the heart. It is only to the man of large and noble soul, to him who blends a cultivated mind with an upright heart, that men yield the tribute of deep and genuine respect. A man should never glory in that which is common to a beast, nor a wise man in that which is common to a fool, nor a good man in that which is common to a wicked man. Since it is in the intellect that we trace the source of all that is great and noble in man, it follows that if any are ambitious to possess a true manhood, they will be men of reflection, men whose daily acts are controlled by their judgment, men who recognize the fact that life is a real and earnest affair that time is fleeting, and consequently resolved to waste none of it in frivolities, men whose life and conversation are indicative of that serious mien and deportment which well becomes those who have great interest committed to their charge, and who are determined that insofar as in them lies life with them shall be a success, who fully realize the importance of every step they may take, and consequently bring to it the careful consideration of a mind trained to think with precision. The man who thinks, reads, studies, and meditates has intelligence cut in his features, stamped on his brow, and gleaming in his eye. Thinking, not growth, makes perfect manhood. There are some who, though they are done growing, are only boys. The constitution may be fixed while the judgment is immature. The limbs may be strong while the reasoning is feeble. Many who can run and jump and bear any fatigue, cannot observe, cannot examine, cannot reason or judge, contrive or execute, they do not think. Such persons, though they may have the figure of a man and the years of a man, are not in possession of manhood. They will not acquire it until they learn to look beyond the present and take broad and comprehensive views of their relations to society. As we often mistake glittering tinsel for solid gold, so we often mistake specious appearances for true worth and manhood. We are too prone to take professions and words in lieu of actions, too easily impressed with good clothes and polite bearings to inquire into the character and doings of the individual. Man should be rated not by his hordes of gold, not by the simple or temporary influence he may for a time exert, but by his unexceptional principles relative both to character and religion. Strike out these and what is he? A savage without sympathy. Take them away and his manship is gone. He no longer lives in the image of his creator. No smile gladdens his lips. No look of sympathy illumines his countenance to tell of love and charity for the woes of others. But let man go abroad with just principles and what is he? An exhaustless fountain in a vast desert a glorious sun, shining ever, dispelling every vestige of darkness. There is love animating his heart, sympathy breathing in every tone, tears of pity, dewdrops of the soul, gather in his eye and gush impetuously down his cheek. A good man is abroad, and the world knows and feels it. Beneath his smile lurks no degrading passion. Within his heart there slumbers no guile. He is not exalted in mortal pride, not elevated in his own views, but honest, moral, and virtuous before the world. He stands throned on truth. His fortress is wisdom, and his dominion is the vast and limitless universe. 
always upright, kind, and sympathizing, always attached to just principles and actuated by the same, governed by the highest motives in doing good. These constitute his only true manliness. Now let's take a closer look at discipline, at the three steps to becoming disciplined. First, true discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 o'clock than get up at 6. It's easier to go to bed late, sleep late, show up late, leave early. It's easier not to read. It's easier to turn on the television than to open a book. It's easier to do just enough than to do it all. Waiting is always easier than acting. Trying is always easier than doing. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning or keep our garage clean or pay our taxes or show up for work tomorrow. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things? Wouldn't it be fascinating? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. Each has its own price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. What we wish we had done is the voice of regret speaking in a sorrowful tone at a time when there is no going back. This is regret. No second chance. No what would I do differently. Choose one or the other, but both will have their price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. One costs pennies, the other a fortune. Dostoevsky said, there are hundreds of young men who would die for the truth but very few who would spend five years studying to know what the truth is. Dying for the truth is much more dramatic than the discipline of studying it one little piece at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time. But in the big picture, is dying for the truth really easier than adhering to the daily disciplines? The first lesson of discipline is that it isn't the easiest option. The second lesson of discipline is that it's a full-time activity. And we've said that the best form of discipline is consistent self-discipline. You see, the discipline that it takes to make your bed every day is the same discipline necessary for success in the world of business. The discipline to organize your garage is the same discipline to organize your business. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? Pretty soon, the lazy side will creep in and destroy the disciplined side. The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Consistency cannot be inconsistent. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is a set of standards which we've selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirement for honoring these standards. Once we've adopted these standards of behavior and conduct, we're committed to honor them. And if we don't, then there can be no disciplined activity. We find ourselves announcing our standards to our relatives, our friends, our associates, we shout our beliefs and condemn those who believe any differently, but then we don't walk the talk. We end up acting in a way far different from the beliefs we've shouted. We tell our kids that the TV is rotting their minds, yet we spend our evenings in front of it. We tell our employees that they must take advantage of every minute of the working day, yet we spend three hours at lunch. Do as I say, not as I do. This is inconsistent. This leads to a loss of credibility among those who watch us. And more importantly, this leads to a loss of credibility within ourselves. The only thing worse than one who is inconsistent in applying their self-imposed disciplines 
is one who has never considered the need or the value of discipline at all. These people seem to wander aimlessly, changing procedures, changing standards, changing loyalties and shifting frequently from one commitment to another, leaving behind a trail of broken friendships, unfinished projects and unfulfilled promises, all because of a discipline that was either non-existent or imposed so infrequently that it was ineffective. Here's the third step to becoming consistently self-disciplined. Number one is realizing that discipline isn't the easiest option. Number two, discipline is a full-time activity, day by day, every day. And the third step to becoming self-disciplined is really a philosophy that holds one of life's unique promises. Number three simply says, for every disciplined effort, there is a multiple reward. That's one of life's great arrangements. It's like the law of sowing and reaping. In fact, it's an extension of the biblical law that says if you sow well, you reap well. Now here's a unique part of the law of sowing and reaping. Not only does it suggest that we'll all reap what we've sown, it also suggests that we'll reap much more. Life is full of laws that both govern and explain behaviors. But this may well be the major law we need to understand. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. What a concept. If you render unique service, your reward will be multiplied. If you're fair and honest and patient with others, your reward will be multiplied. If you give more than you expect to receive, your reward is more than you expect. But remember, the key word here, as you might well imagine, is discipline. Everything of value requires care and attention. Everything of value requires discipline. Children require discipline. They must have a structure built for them. They must have boundaries to work within so they feel secure and comfortable to explore and grow. They must learn to recognize what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable. Children require unwavering discipline, consistent discipline, or they'll be confused as to how they're supposed to behave. Likewise, our thoughts require discipline. We must set up our inner boundaries, our codes of conduct, or our thoughts will be confused. And with confused thoughts, we'll end up being confused hopelessly lost in the maze of life, and confused thoughts produce confused results. Look around you at this very moment in time. What might you be doing that needs attention? Perhaps you're listening to this program as you drive along in traffic, blowing your horn at someone ahead of you who isn't driving at the speed you'd like to. Perhaps you're listening alone because you've had a disagreement with someone you love or someone who loves you and your anger won't allow you to speak to that person, wouldn't this be an ideal time to examine your need for a new discipline? Perhaps you're on the brink of giving up or starting over or starting out, and the only missing ingredient to your incredible success story in the future is a new and self-imposed discipline that will make you stay longer and try harder and work more intensely than you ever thought you possibly could. The most valuable form of discipline is the one that you impose on yourself. Don't wait for things to deteriorate so drastically that someone else must impose discipline into your life. Wouldn't that be tragic? How could you possibly explain the fact that someone else thought more of you than you thought of yourself? That they forced you to get up early and get out into the marketplace when you would have been content to let success go to someone else who cared more about themselves? Your life, my life, the life of each one of us is going to serve as either a warning or an example. A warning of the consequences of neglect, self-pity, lack of direction and ambition, or an example of talent put to use, of discipline, self-imposed, and of objectives clearly perceived and intensely pursued. Now, can too much discipline be a bad thing? Can you possibly be too disciplined? Too much of anything is a bad thing. Life without balance results in an unbalanced life. 
Walking around the block every day is good. Walking or running six hours a day is bad. It's obsessive. Unless, of course, you make your living as a marathon runner. Then you're doing your job. Eating an apple a day is good. Eating only apples is bad. You won't get all the protein and vitamins and nutrients your body needs. Working hard, burning the midnight oil, doing it until is good. Working nonstop, never taking a vacation, never having any fun, never spending quality time with the people you love, working, working, working day after day, month after month, never taking a break year after year is bad. If you've got your nose to the grindstone all the time, how are you ever going to spot new opportunities, consider new ideas? It doesn't work that way. You've got to stop and ponder where you've been and where you're going. You've got to reflect so you know if you're even on the right track. Some of you, the way you are now, it is by the grace of God that your salvation is still with you. You nearly lost it because of some certain situations and problems. Because I was jealous of the proud when I saw that things go well for the wicked. He looked at the prosperity of the wicked. He looked at the way the lavish money. He looks at the car they are driving. He looked at the house they are living. He looked at their body, how they are shining. He looked at how things are going well. And he said, I nearly lost confidence in God. I said go with all of my heart but yet there is a sickness in me and God never took it so when I saw all this I nearly lost my confidence people who are not praying the way I'm praying they have money to pay their rent but every month I have to go and beg before I can pay my They do not suffer as others do. They do not have the trouble that others have. They are not suffering the way you are suffering. They don't look for jobs the way you are looking for jobs. They don't even pay for promotion. So all these things entice me. All these things intimidate me. I nearly lost my confidence. There are things around you. If there is not taken, you will lose your confidence. Man of God, I am close to the altar. But when I see people who are far from the altar and I see what they are doing, I nearly lost my confidence. Every Sunday, I go to church. But those who never go to church, they came to church with their husband to get married. And me inside the church, I come much to the altar for my own marriage. Those who are ungodly, they are aborting babies. But me that I'm looking for baby genuinely in God, I can't get one. I nearly lost my confidence. Those that can bribe to get tenders, they do prosper. But me that I want to live a righteous life, and I know bribery is a sin, and I cannot bribe, so I can't get a tender. I lost, I nearly lost my confidence. I am a pastor. I am a man of God. Pure in us. Pure in us. I, I don't want to do multi to get a crowd when my church is no full. My church is no growing. When I see people who are charging money in order to speak or prophesy, and I do not charge money to see me is free. When people are not coming, I nearly lost my confidence. And I remember what God said that pride go before fall but now they are no fun instead of their pride to keep bring them down they are being lifted more i humble myself but i am not rising they are proud but they are increasing i nearly lost my confidence you told me father that if I humble myself, you will come and heal my life. But I humble myself, I live my life in humility. But yes, I am not up to their standard. I nearly lost my confidence. Oh God, why do you punish me? Can I prophesy? If you are under this category, 
within 48 hours your situation will change i want this message to be spread to everyone when you get it go if you're on facebook help me to spread this message of today sometimes we have to ask ourselves what's using my life One of the things that we know about life is that it is always changing. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes things go real well, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes you're happy, and sometimes you're sad. Now that's that thing called life. And when we begin to understand and know that, accepting that reality that that we will never ever have things just on an even kill all the time. That you're gonna have some ups and you're gonna have some downs. But during those down moments, that's where the growth takes place. That's where the work is. Anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they have happy relationships, the children are acting normal. Anybody can be positive then. Anybody can have a larger vision then. Anybody can have faith under those kinds of circumstances. See, but the real challenge, the real challenge of growth, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, comes when you get knocked down. How you handle it, that's where the growth takes place. What has brought you to this point? What did you learn from it? Are you learning anything? Or are you doing it over and over and over again? Are you going through it or are you growing through it? Are you bigger and better because of it? Things are going to happen to you. And the most important thing to do is to harness your will and let it go. I'm in control here. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this destroy me. I'm coming back and I'll be stronger and better because of it. You have got to make a declaration that this is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for health. You want it and you're going to go all out to have it. Yes, I'm going to turn this situation around. I'm not going to sit back and, and moan and cry over what happened and what went wrong and who did what. I'm going to do something about this situation. Expect things to get better for you because they are. See, life is cyclic. Whatever experience you're having right now, it has not come to stay. It has come to pass. become your reality you are where you are today in part because of what you've been saying about yourself words are like seeds when you speak something out you give life to what you're saying if you continue to say it eventually that can become a reality whether you realize it or not you are prophesying your future and this is great when we're saying things like I'm blessed I'm strong I will accomplish my dreams. I'm coming out of debt. That's not just being positive. You are prophesying victory, prophesying success, prophesying new levels. Your life will move in the direction of your words. But too many people go around prophesying just the opposite. I never get any good breaks. I'll never get back in shape. Business is slow. I'll probably get laid off. Flu season is here. I always get it. They don't realize they are prophesying defeat. It's just like they're calling in bad breaks, mediocrity, lack. You can't talk defeat and expect to have victory. You can't talk lack, not enough, can't afford it, never get ahead, and expect to have abundance. If you have a poor mouth, you're going to have a poor life. If you don't like what you're seeing, start sowing some different seeds. 
It's never gonna happen. Just give up. Just settle. It's not meant. Accept the fear. You're not the one. They just better. You're too weak. No one wants to hear you. Try something else. No one likes you. Just follow. Do like everybody else. Do it the easy way. Accept being broke. Quit dreaming. What are you doing? Why do you have to be so damn different? We all have this negative self-talk that goes in our head. Guess what? There's enough people that are telling us we can't do it, that we're not good enough. Why do we want to tell ourselves that? We know for a fact that thoughts influence actions. We saw it there with the, um, with the video Sheldon, Dr. Levy showed, right? We know that our thoughts influence actions. Why do we want to say that negative self-talk to ourselves? We need to get our own self-affirmations. Muhammad Ali, what was his self-affirmation? I am the greatest. Who else is gonna tell you? There need to be quiet moments in your bedroom, quiet moments when you're brushing your teeth, that we need to reaffirm, I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. That is my affirmation. It, if I don't believe it, no one else will. How do you build self-confidence? Get away from the people who will tear you down. There's enough of that. Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. There is no one better than me. It's a difference between hubris and ego and false pride. It's just reminding yourself in quiet, silent moments. I put it down on a list. It's right beside my mirror, right? About all the things that make me who I am. Because I make enough mistakes and the newspapers will recognize it and people around me will recognize it and they'll tear me down. And pretty soon I'll begin to believe it. Stop the self-talk, the negative self-talk. If you'll watch, you'll see some athletes, they'll have a little bandage or a little um, brand around them. Uh, Lance Armstrong's a perfect one. What's his self-affirmation? Live strong isn't a brand. It was to remind him of who he was. Live strong. Then it came a brand. He would move that from one arm to the next arm when doubt and fear came into his mind. Live strong. Put it on there. Let's go. We'll all have it. Replace it. I believe passionately that we can shift the negative voices and stories that are going on in our minds into positive ones. How do you do that? Well, there's three main questions. The first question is, is it the truth? Is whatever I'm sharing with someone or what you're hearing from someone else that's giving you feedback about your life true? You know 100% that it's true. First question. Second question. Is it necessary? Is what I'm saying to myself in my head, is it necessary in the exact moment in what I'm doing with my life right then? And the third question is, does it improve upon the silence? Somewhere deep inside, you know what kind of person you were designed to be. If you want to produce great acorns, think like an oak, not like an acorn. Think like the person you intend to become. Like the Christian question, what would Jesus do? Ask yourself, how would the person I'd like to be do the things I'm about to do? So let me ask a question. What kind of seed is in you? Figure out who you are. Don't apologize for who you are. And then become even greater than you naturally are at what you are. If I could give you one thing to take from this, it is no one will believe in you unless you do. Listen to the words of that video. Here's to the crazy ones the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes. We're supposed to be different, folks. And when people look at us, believe in yourself.